This is Kim Seaver with the Alberta Worker Podcast. You are listening to episode three of season one of the Alberta Worker Podcast. Thank you for tuning in today. I am grateful to have as a guest, Sandra Azakar, who is one of six vice presidents with the AUPE. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you for having me. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. You did it perfectly. It's awesome. actually Azokar, yeah, but uh, I'll take your version of it. Azokar? No, Azokar. It's Sandra Azokar, but if you pronounce it the way that everybody pronounces it, you said it perfectly. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, Spanish is not my first language. So. <laughs> Great. Well, let's get right into it. Um, I'm grateful that you have agreed to be my guest. And let's just talk about your personal history, you know, sort of like where you grew up what family life was like growing up, education, and then as we're talking about that, try to incorporate your personal labor history. First of all, thank you for having me on, on this podcast. I, I always like to share my story because I, I think my background and, and my childhood sets a stage of, of why it is that I'm involved in the labor movement and why it is that I believe that social justice is so important in everything that we do. I was born uh, in Santiago, Chile, led a pretty normal uh, life with my parents, uh, my dad and my mom and my two siblings. My dad had a uh, uh, a very rough childhood because his mom died when he was very young and so he was raised by various relatives and dad who was never around so he made sure that um, his children would never have to go without um, as he did as a child and, and he worked very hard to make sure that we lack for nothing there was always good education available to us and everything that any kid needed to have a normal life but uh, our world turned completely upside down on September the 11th in 1973 when the democratically elected uh, socialist government of Allende was overturned by a U.S. backed uh, and led uh, coup and my dad was taken from his work site to a stadium where he was imprisoned along with all his co-workers he was was tortured and taken to a concentration camp uh, in the north of Chile uh, called Chacabuco, which was an abandoned saltpeter mine. And that's where he spent about a year of his life. My dad's biggest political crime was that um, he belonged to the union. He was an activist and participated in, in the uh, you know, in the folk group and, and the union always played a big important role in our family because my dad was very active in, in, in social uh, and family activities were very much part of, of, of the work that he did in, in the union. But that was his big political crime. So he said he was tortured, put in a concentration camp. And then when he was released, he was exiled to Argentina, where we joined him um, and we lived in a refugee camp for about a year prior to coming to Canada in 1975. During that time, when we lived in Argentina in this refugee camp, it's a little bit different than what people kind of have as, as an image of what a refugee camp was. All my aunts and uncles, because in Chile we call all the adults aunts and uncles, were part of that of that progressive, you know, movement that that changed Chile in in the 1970s. And so they made sure that we had, you know, that they created our own kind of art and, and social uh, hub for the little kids that were there. So we were we were cared for. And I, I think when you're a kid, you don't realize what's happening around you and, and you just basically see everything as an adventure. And then coming to Canada was definitely the uh, other adventure that we had. My dad applied through the UN and we came to Canada as refugees in 1975. And at that time, we didn't have settlement services, so it was uh, kind of a bit of a trip without any kind of support. So the Chilean community became an extended family. We were all very close-knit, and we supported each other um, and were involved in, in social and political activities throughout my entire childhood. Our stay in Canada was supposed to be temporary. My, my dad, the first two years that we lived here was like, oh, you don't have to learn how to speak English. We're going back home. You know, this this is basically it. We need to go back and, and support our brothers and sisters. We need to go back and continue to fight the dictatorship. And so that was the intent of absolutely every Chilean that was here is just to stay here for a bit and then go back. So all the activities that we carried out were around that supporting what was happening in, in our country. We had incredible amounts of protests and, and trying to bring attention to Canadians as 
as to what was happening and the human rights violations that were taking place in Chile at that time. And so my childhood was spent doing that instead of going to brownies or or doing any kind of other stuff that kids normally do, I was taking political education classes. And at the age of 11, I became a member of the Chilean Socialist Party after taking all these political classes. And you were in Canada when you became a member of the party? Yeah. And so how how old were you when you immigrated with your family? I, I was about seven, eight. Wow. And do you remember your dad like being taken and imprisoned and everything? Um, yes, I do remember that because um, normally what would, would happen was that um, moms would have to go in their attempt to find the location of where their husbands or or family or whatever was who was missing and, and they didn't know where they were, would always take a kid with them so that they wouldn't disappear because of the, at that time, sometimes in order for uh, the military to get people to talk in jail or in these places where they were being held, they would say, you know what, we have your wife and we'll do what we will need to do for you to talk. So a lot of times people would disappear. It was not a, it was a very dark moment in our history, very scary moment to be a kid actually. And so I would often have to go with my mom to all these places where I don't think kids should have to go, but you know, you understand why, why that was a reality. And I even had the opportunity to go and see my dad in the concentration camp that he was at. And the hope that my mom had at that point was that I would be able to go in to that camp. It was, a, it was mined all the way around and there was watchtowers. It was basically a concentration camp. Chile has the driest desert in the world at the Kama Desert, and this is where okay. this was that. So you could hear the echo of the military saying, "No, she can't come in," you know. And I'm, and then me telling my mom, "I don't, I don't really want to go in there. I don't want to go." It was hard. It was, it was really hard. You know, the the whole experience of September the 11th was hard on us as kids too, because at the end, like that day that this happened, there was a, a radio station a couple of blocks away from where we lived that was bombed. Um, because it was a, a government radio station, and so we we heard the bombs very early in the day, and then and then of course you know later on um, the next day, uh, one of the neighbors that worked with my dad came to tell us that my dad had been taken in there, that there had been all kinds of deaths because they killed quite a few of his co-workers in in the place where he was working at. My dad was a machinist, a millwright, mm-hmm. and okay. so so that's that's you know how. The whole thing started. And and of course, you lived in fear because the military would come into your home and search it randomly and looking for evidence or whatever it is that they were looking for. So it was never a pleasant time. And my mom had never worked, so she had to go and work. We had to start selling our our belongings because we had no money, no food. It was just a, a really dark time for all of us. Yeah. What did your mom do when she had to go to work? What was she working as? Um, she actually had never worked in her life. My mom got married when she was 16, 17. So okay. she worked as uh, cleaning somebody's house and, oh, okay. you know, at the end, um, what she made was good enough for us to have one good meal a week. Um, mm-hmm. and the rest, it was whatever we had in the house. Right. But that's why we had to start selling our stuff. Yeah. It sounded like you had to grow up pretty young, grow up pretty quickly. You, you become quite aware of what is happening. You, you stop being basically a carefree child. And I, I like to say that because we had such a good and careless kind of childhood prior to September the 11th. And then on yeah. September the 11th, somebody turned the light switch and you stop being a kid. And, and you have the reality, right? But we all knew exactly why that had happened, why my dad was away. And and you analyze it, I, I think, from a little kid's perspective. But it's, you know, it's something that you you basically are quite aware of what is happening around you. Sure. Okay. So you're you're in Canada. You're 11 years old. You joined the, the Socialist Party in Chile. What, yeah. How does your life keep going from there? So we... um. You know, what that meant for me was that you always needed to be politically engaged and and learning about uh, political processes and and learning about who held power and how power never conceded anything without you fighting for uh, for it. Right. Um, So it kind of formed my my way of thinking. And I and I think in a lot of ways, you know, it, it helped me have the ability to look at 
what I do now, which is mobilizing and organizing members from that understanding of, of, of the power dynamics and, and then the class um, analysis that needs to happen when, when we're talking about workers and what that means in the economy and in the political landscape and so forth, right? So it definitely prepared me for that. I was very active in, in the Chilean community doing different things. I was in charge of the you know, of the youth group, if you wanted to call it, being involved and growing up so fast also meant that, you know, I was doing things that perhaps kids shouldn't be doing. So I had my my first child when I was 16. Yeah, my and, mom was just barely 17 when she had me. So then again, you also have to grow up because you become a parent, right? So I finished high school, again, doing all kinds of volunteer. We worked quite extensively with the Ukrainian community here in Edmonton because we used our hall all the time. We held all kinds of activities, social, cultural, and sports activities, and all the funds that we would raise, we would send back to Chile. We didn't, we weren't kind of like that community where, you know, you build a community hall and, and then you do all that kind of stuff. No, we did political activities, fundraising that went straight to Chile to whatever activity was happening there. You know, I, I went to university with my kid in tow. The first jobs that I, that I had were always in, in the social area field. I worked for an organization called the Latin American Self-Help Society of Alberta. You know, we did all kinds of English courses. We helped uh, refugees settle. We, we were among the first settlement agencies that were around, um, you know, working with the food bank, working around the issues of poverty, around the issues of lack of, of services for, for newly arrived Latin American refugees. You got to kind of put it into the context of that time because we were getting all kinds of um, Central American refugees who were coming uh, from very violent uh, regimes as well. Um, and so together with the Salvadorians, Guatemalans, Nicaraguans, we all kind of started to work together to kind of at least create some semblance of, of settlement services. But again, I think we were all so traumatized from where we came from that none of those organizations kind of stuck for a very long time. So they were not for profit, we would run them, and then they would go away. To make a long story short, I finished university in 1987. I started working for the government of, of Alberta in, in the area of uh, welfare, it was called at that time, is income supports now as a social worker. And in 1987, I became a member of the Alberta Union of Provincial Employees. We had incredible issues of, of uh, high, high uh, workloads at that time, um, mm -hmm. both in child welfare and in income support. My caseload at that time was 800 clients. I was working with the um, unemployables. Wow. I remember at that time, the government wanted to deinstitutionalize everybody and send them into the community. The problem was that they send them into the community without any kind of support services, uh, just like we see now. But at that time, you know, they actually went ahead and did it. Out. So it was it was really difficult for those people who had been in jail for 20 plus years to go into the community and pretend to have a, a semblance of normalcy when you don't have that. Right. AIDS was a big thing at that point as well. Right. And um, and again, you know, my clients didn't have the support that they needed. So a lot of them died a very lonely death. Um, and I would be the only one at their funeral. You know, I had clients that basically had all kinds of addictions issues that were intergenerational, where I would meet them and then I would meet their kids that would come on to social assistance. So that was my case. So trying to deal with that uh, issue. And at that time, um, the union used to bargain collective agreements separately. Now we have a big giant table that, that covers all of uh, the government services. But at that time, each local, like each area would bargain their own contracts. So local six of which I'm part of uh, human services was one of those locals. And what happened was that we, we went into bargaining um, and I became quite involved in, in trying to get as much information as possible. I became a worksite contact. I became a union steward at that time. And we started organizing ourselves around this contract negotiations. And what we wanted was not so much money, but it was for them to deal with the workload issue right? because we couldn't continue to do our jobs in the way that we were doing. We weren't serving anybody. Sure, of course. We went on an illegal strike on May the, the 1st, 1990. 
tiny. And that was the beginning of my activism, my my very loud activism, because that strike taught me uh, quite a few um, lessons when it comes to what it means to be in a union, or what it means to be in a large union, and what it is that we need to do as workers to kind of have power within our union movement, right? So we were on an illegal strike for 22 days. We had a lot of a lot of uh, um, public support. Our clients would even go with us uh, and pick it um, because they knew they knew that we were like dying in 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 the way that we were doing work, right? Yeah, you know, we would go every day to the ledge protests in the afternoon. We we try to push ourselves into government meetings and 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 trying to get our our voice out there. And so, yeah, those were the twenty two days of May. One morning, we get to the picket line, and we were told, "Oh, by the way, the the strike is over. Your union president uh, signed your contract, um, and you need to go back to work." But you hadn't even got a chance to vote on it or anything. No. Or oh. did our bargaining committee even know that that's what the union president was going to do? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And so we were all like beside ourselves, like we had put ourselves out there for 22 days. When we tried to meet with the union leadership, the president at that time did not show up at any of the meetings. She sent vice presidents. And uh, yeah, we were incredibly upset at how this had been handled as a result of the uh of the strike, we got one day suspension, a letter of discipline on our files. The only good thing is that none of us got fired, but we did get a letter of discipline and a letter of understanding uh, around the issue of workloads. (laughs) The letter of understanding meant absolutely nothing. And so what happened in the in the next convention is that we went into convention with full force and push forward resolutions that basically made it clear that no president would ever be allowed to do that ever again, uh, go behind our negotiators um, back and, and sign an agreement without um, having the membership agree to it. Yeah, we were incredibly angry. Uh, yeah. We were too poor to, to disaffiliate and join another union. So we decided to fight internally and, you know, get into elected positions and basically become stronger as a result of that experience. And, you know, we we don't often talk about that strike in AUP. (laughs) I can wonder why. (laughs) But it was uh, it was a very good teaching uh, tool for a lot of us that continue to work within the union. And and it's not something that you can forget or that you can um, have some kind of revisionist history around it. It's it's what happened, right? As a result of that strike, I, I be, like I said, I became quite involved with the union and I've always been in different uh, chapters or locals. Since that time uh, in 2006, I thought I move out of my local uh, and chapter work and um, I ran as a vice president. So I was uh, first elected um, as a vice president in 2006. During that time, I was uh, quite active. I was a chair of the Women's Committee as well as the chair of the Human Rights Committee. And uh, we did a lot of work around the issue of domestic violence. During my my tenure as a chair of the Women's Committee, we had at least four deaths of women in our union um, that had been killed by their intimate partners and their husbands. We thought that the issue of domestic violence in Alberta, which has always been an ongoing issue and continues to be an issue, we handled uh, from the point of view of labor because uh, it extends to uh, the work site when somebody is being abused at home. And there's always that potential of of the abuser coming into uh, the workplace and and hurting everybody there. So we did a lot of work in in that area, raised tons of funds uh, for the families of the impacted members, put in a lot of good resolutions about making sure that the the staff in in our union um, were able to deal with or identify cases of domestic violence and so forth. That's awesome. You know, in, in our human rights committee work, we also try to deal with a lot of uh, of issues around inclusivity, identifying the faces in our work sites. Sometimes I think it, as unions, we our leadership doesn't necessarily reflect the faces of our work sites. And so sure. we want to remove some of the barriers to access. So, you know, we created our own pool of translators. We created, uh, you 
you know, information pamphlets in various languages. We tried to do a lot of work to kind of address some, like I said, some of those barriers to participation. Mm-hmm. And I and I always thought that that was important. Tons of strikes. AUP at that time uh, were uh, organizing a lot of the long-term care facilities, mostly private long-term care facilities, okay. and those facilities again don't don't go into the union world quite lightly without a fight. And so um, we had tons of first contract uh, strikes. You know, places that have been unionized and and their bargaining fights. I, my last strike was about eighty nine days, or so about eighty nine days with Hardesty. Tons of picket lines that I have um, had the opportunity to walk on around the issues of of uh, seniors care. And, and were you on one just last week? We were just on uh, an information rally. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, the issue of uh, the good Sam um, failing to wanting to come to the table for the last five years. And that, you know, that's just one good example of, of how these employers try to undermine not only the union, but their employees, because none of these long-term care facilities actually lost any money during this pandemic. The government made sure that they uh, were compensated for any COVID-related revenue loss, not wanting to negotiate just a slap in the face to all those people that that had to come to work every day. Again, going back to that work, um, while I was sitting as a vice president, I also sat on the board of Friends of Medicare. I sat on the board of Friends of Medicare for six years. And then in 2012, I left AUP and I became the executive director of Friends of Medicare. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. And so um, in my role in in an organization that has been for the last 40 plus years fighting to promote uh, the protection and and expansion of our public health care system, I was very, very busy with any of the governments that were in power during that time that I was the executive director. And that included for the first time, not a conservative government. We had the NDP government in place. So again, that was an eye opener in terms of where we needed to be with public health and, and the fight that needed to continue to ensure that our public health care system was protected and expanded. So what was it like advocating for public health care under the NDP government? Because everybody always assumes it was really bad under the conservative government. But I'm curious what things were like under the NDP government as far as advocating. You know, it was it was a, a surreal kind of reality uh, initially. We didn't know what our role would be. I mean, the the NDP was limited to some degree in what they could do and what they could not do or what choices they could or could not make. Uh, so limited by what or who um, is, is up for debate. I mean, to, to have a cultural change in the way that the narrative is around the area of privatization requires sometimes just that a narrative change. We didn't see that. So for example, in the area of home care, which is heavily privatized, one of the best kept secrets around our home, uh, around our public health care system, that home care is one of those areas that's uh, almost all privatized now. And and even now this government is trying to even bring more privatization that they could have started changing that. You know, they had the example of Manitoba where home care was under the uh, public health care system. Home care is an integral part of our health care system. So fighting Mm -hmm. for that was not fruitful in any way because we weren't able to move the needle, even in the way that we talked about home care. In the area of seniors care, we wanted narrative change. We wanted the government to stop talking or or taking pictures of themselves, you know, uh, breaking ground with these private for-profit companies. We wanted them to say, ideally in our perfect world that seniors care would be brought under the uh, public health care umbrella but we never heard that the needle shifted a little bit but not far enough people say we only had four years but then again we had only had four years where we needed to kind of go in there gung-ho and and make those significant changes right so we did see quite a few positive steps that we may perhaps may not have seen under uh, a conservative government, but um, how far could we have taken it and how far we actually took it is is one of those things that will be judged in many years to come. Yeah, well, I mean, if they happen to win next year, maybe hopefully they've learned they learned their lesson last time and be a little bit more assertive in how they approach healthcare. We'll see what happens, I guess. 
Well, they will have to be because I think that that's one of the areas where um, that's going to be in the ballot box and everybody will be talking about our healthcare system. So they'll be faced with uh, some pretty clear decisions that they need to make. Okay. So I think you said 2012, you started as the executive director at Friends of Medicare. Where did you go from there? In December of 2021. I uh, put my name forward again, just so that you know, while I was in working in Friends of Medicare, I continued to have a position in a job that I have had for what it feels like a hundred years, but it hasn't been a hundred years. With uh, children's services, I, I work at the Edmonton Crisis Unit, which is uh, after hours uh, for child welfare. That's how I continue to be a member of AUP. At the end of 2021, I put my name forward for the position of vice president again. I was successful in very humbled to be re-elected as one of the six vice presidents. Um, and here you are today. And here I am today. Yeah. Awesome. That is an amazing story, Sanja. There's a lot you, you said there that was completely unexpected. That's quite this story. I really appreciate you sharing all that. I can see how the experiences of your youth really shaped how you became involved, and not just like in labor issues, but just like in your career path. The fact that you spent pretty much your entire adult life helping people that was really influenced by by the experiences of your youth. That's an inspiring story that you shared. I still think that there's so much work that needs to be done, but I guess that's what moves us forward, right? In, in terms of wanting to continue to, to push for social justice at every level and for us to continue to reinforce. So there, there's so much work that needs to be done uh, around our um, labor world in, in organizing and expanding you know, unionization rates and and making sure that uh, workers are valued um, and continue to be supported. Tons of work that needs to be done and so much responsibility that we still have to kind of make sure that that's the case, right? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the purposes of my podcast is I want to provide a little bit different take on things. There are a lot of there are a lot of leftist podcasts there out there that are, you know, a bunch of white guys talking. And so my hope for this podcast is to have my guests primarily be from uh, other marginalized populations. And so what I'm wondering for you is like how has your intersections of marginalization influenced the experiences you had as a worker? So for example, you said you came to Canada from Chile. So as a new Canadian, how did that influence the experiences you had as a worker, as a woman, as a person of color, these sorts of things? How did they uh, influence any experiences you had as a worker? You know, I, I think in a lot of ways, what we what we have to face is there's a lot of times where people think that because we come from another country, we don't understand the fight or we don't understand mm -hmm. understand the struggle or what we need to do here. And, you know, and, and it's kind of like sometimes that condescending kind of conversations that we hear often about, oh, well, they're from from that country. And so they don't really understand how we do things here. I think if you talk to anybody who comes from any other country where the sometimes the rule of law is not exactly like Canadian rule of law, you will understand that when people put themselves in a strike line, when people get involved in unions, they do it from a place of passion. They do it from a place of knowing perhaps that their lives could be at risk. And so you don't take that lightly. They don't see it as a privilege like we have here. It is a responsibility if you want to make your life and the life of your community better. And so... I think for me, that's the biggest thing is that um, we need to stop that kind of like conversation um, and, and basically inviting people in to participate, not from this place of, of we know it all and they don't, um, it's from a, a real place of inclusivity and, and understanding where people come from is really important. Pre-migratory experiences is what shapes people and, and when they come to a country is how they will relate to the new country. So for me, understanding that as, a, as a, somebody who comes from another country is, is a different kind of way of engaging with our, with our members or a different way of reaching out. As somebody said to me the other day, which I found really interesting, is that I am where I am because I can pass for one of them. And I'm like, what wow. do you mean for one of them? Because you're, you're lighter than, than most people brown people. And I thought, well, that is such a sad, it's a funny but sad statement, right? And then when I won the first time, this guy came up to me and he said, you know, it doesn't take very much for uh, a, a little girl from down south to make a, a passionate speech and win. 
if you really want to win next time, you need to talk to me. And I thought, you know what? what? First of all, I'm not a little girl. I'm a woman. I'm a full ass grown woman. And secondly, my speech was not just a passionate speech. It was my life. I'm sure you could teach him a thing or two about worker solidarity and putting in the fight. Like, honestly, that's very paternalistic. Yeah, but those are the kinds of things that you often face, right? Um, and so, you know, you, you, you learn to kind of try and have conversations with people. And sometimes it's frustrating when you when you're trying to identify barriers to participation from this point of view, right? Because people don't like to be called out. They don't like to be in a position where they feel that you are, you're basically, um, you know, accusing them of something. And then and, and that's not the case at all. It's, it's, it's how do we work together? How do, like I said, the majority of our leadership and, and a lot of our components, like locals, chapters, or, or whatever, are not sometimes representative of, of the uh, work site, right? So we have a lot of work to do in growing and in any union that you do, because I mean, I've had the opportunity to be among other uh, conventions, other work sites and everything else. And, and that's a reality for quite a bit of the of the unions, right? Regardless of whether they're healthcare unions or private unions, it, regardless of what it is, the reality is that in Canada, the majority of our workers are from other places and, and that has changed over the years, right? And yeah. it will continue to change. Um, so how do we, as a labor movement, move from that uh, point and, and engage people the best that we can. It will require us to create those spaces where people feel safe participating from their own strength, right? Places of strength, because we just assume that they don't have any. But I can tell you, I've been on many picket lines where we've had to hold people back because, you know, sometimes... Um, you know, in in, uh, in Africa or even in Chile or even in the Philippines, when you cross a picket line, you get hit. You get hit by a stick, you know, and we're not, you know, pushing violence or anything like that. But the rules here um, are, are sometimes when, when we, you know, we have, oh, we can't, you know, get 100 meters close to this or you can't <laughs> touch the scav van or you can't scream at them. You can only scream at them for three, three minutes. It's a three minute rule. Do you know what I mean? And so we all... Yeah. You abide by that, but in reality, people that come from other countries are not used to that. That kind of like so, they're used to a little bit more action. And like I said, I'm not. I'm not inviting violence or inciting violence or saying that that's okay. But that's that's where we come from, right? And 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 so for us, it's like, oh my god, this is so lame. Like I don't I don't understand this. But then you live in Canada and you accept it, right? A, a few years ago, I started writing a um, a book on the labor history of Lethbridge, and Lethbridge has a, a very strong labor history. Uh, started in the um, the mining community, of course. Uh, I only got up to 1920, but there was a a big strike back in 19. 16, I think it was. Miners were um, setting bombs off at scabs' houses. And then now, when you are protesting, and it doesn't even have to be a strike, it could just be a regular protest or rally or something. The cops would come by and say, hey, you guys can't be standing on the sidewalk. You're impeding traffic. It's like we've gone from this one one extreme to this other extreme where you can't even stand on the sidewalk. I yeah, know. Quite something. <laughs> and to your point about, um, you know, creating a safe space, like, I wonder if really what we need to do is, is those of us who are in positions of privilege and power is if we just need to listen more, you know, we just need to be able to sit back, take a seat and just listen to those people who have been marginalized. And I think it does a couple of things. I think it'll empower other people who are like them. And then I think it'll give those of us with um, different kinds of privilege and power to be able to realize that not only do they have something to say, but they have things to say that we've never considered, things to say that we've never experienced. Some of the things you have shared with us today are things that I will never experience and have never experienced. And so I think maybe that's one of the key uh, things that we need to do is just be able to sit back and, and listen to the voices of marginalized people. And I think a lot of the unions right now are, are looking into that um, from that IDE lens, but sometimes that, uh, you know, inclusivity, diversity and equity kind of thing. But we have to be really intentional in the changes that we that we make when we're organizing. We have to be intentional in allowing people to actually bring their ideas forward, um, which might be a little bit different. But I think everybody has different political experiences and, and different political biases and different political um I had to tell you you know I, I I always have this conversation about how it is that we 
um, sometimes when we're trying to organize, if we don't do political education, I think we're just basically, and somebody else said this, just organizing events. But what does that political education actually mean, right? It, it actually means that, again, it goes back to that whole power conversation that I was having that I learned very young in life, right? is that who holds the power and as workers how much power can we regain from from all those uh people that that or organizations that actually have that power and are wielding it to their their interests without having those conversations i don't think we we can move forward and and they all have to be done from that lens of inclusivity and and diversity and equity uh, because if we don't then we're doing a disservice to the labor movement and i think we have like i said a responsibility to grow and if we don't regain that power uh, we are going to be at the mercy of of just political power or parties or or the electoral system that just basically sometimes doesn't necessarily meet our needs as workers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you're, you know, spot on there. I think there's a danger when we don't listen to people who who are in marginalized communities that they're going to think that the labor movement isn't for them, that, that it's not going to provide for their material needs. It's not going to, you know, bring about significant change to their material conditions. And then if they come to that conclusion, then they're going to, they're not going to see any point in participating in the labor movement. And so, yeah, I think it's totally important for us to be able to make it clear through that political education that you talked about that the labor movement is about bringing about that material change in the lives of workers. And then if we can convince people of that and not just like tell them so that they believe it, but like show them, we listen to, but then also incorporate their ideas. And then we, uh, we try to address those ideas in whatever way we can. And so as they see their conditions improve, then I think they will um, start to see the benefit of the unions. And honestly, like right now, there seems to be a resurgence in, in unionization within at least Canada and the United States. But I wonder if more of that isn't necessarily that they see unions as being the key to changing their material conditions or that things have just gotten so bad that there has to be another solution. It's like, well, maybe unions are the solution. So Yeah, well, I, and I think that's it. Like you just hit it on the nail there. I, I think situation, like people are looking around and identifying the 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 struggle that that is real, the class struggle that is real for me in, in, in terms of like knowing that without, and, and COVID helped in, in, in that realization, right, is that if we don't have those protections that our society can't function. And I, I'm hoping, too, that people have also come to the realization that their labor is, is essential and that their labor, without it, our society does not function. I think initially there was a recognition of essential workers, but that quickly uh, went to the wayside when we're talking about some kind of recovery, right? Because now all of a sudden we're not essential anymore. A lot of our workers went from heroes to zeros very quickly. And that continues to happen, right? Yeah, we're only essential workers if we generate profit for the corporations. Yeah, and I think COVID brought that to uh, a head when it comes to that. And I'm I'm hoping that people will start um, seeing things in a different way and and really, um, you know, questioning why it is that we as workers always have to uh, take the meager kind of offerings that, especially in public services, that governments and these private for-profit organizations give us as, as if it was something that we, um, you know, needed to be thankful for, even though they continue to, to do well with, with our labor. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any final thoughts you want to leave with the listeners? No, I, I think for me, it's, I think it's important that people recognize their value and fight for that um, to be recognized and, and never forget that it goes without saying that that together we're stronger. And, and one way that we can actually do that is if we, as a labor movement, open up and, and work together as a labor movement, not just as individual unions and silos that it, uh, until we, we start to think in those terms that we our, our fight is going to be somewhat harder. So my invitation is is for exactly for that is for the entire movement at some point to come together and and regain that power that we wield just through our labor. Awesome. Thank you. Now, uh, if people want to see more uh, or hear and see more of you, where can they follow you and your work? Yeah, you can you can follow me on Twitter uh, um, at uh, Sandra IAZ. I'll be sure to put that in the description. And if, if they want to get in touch with me, email me at... Uh, S.Azokar uh, 
azocr at aup.org. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, thank you all the followers for joining in today. If you want to uh, follow Alberta Worker, you can follow us on our social media platforms as well. Just look for Alberta Worker on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can visit our website at albertaworker.ca. And we also have a daily, weekly, and monthly newsletter where we email out our most popular stories that we published. We publish a daily news story, and then we send it out uh, every day. And then we do a summary every week, and then a summary every Every month. Next week, we will be interviewing Dominic Shaw. He was the first wheelchair bound person to ever repel in Calgary's annual Easter Seals drop zone. Should be in a really good interview. And if you want to be a guest on the Alberta Worker, just email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca or you can hit me up on social media. Thank you, Sandra, for joining us today. Thank you, all of you, for tuning in and solidarity. Solidarity. Thank you.